Is it a great day to be a Christian? We've started a brand new year. Nobody knows what this year will bring. One of my favorite quotes about this is that uh, no one knows what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And that's what we need to remember this morning. As Christians, that should give us great hope about this year and about all, whatever time we have ahead of us. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The Moody Bible Institute is an organization, I think it's in, headquartered in Chicago. They operate a home for mentally challenged young people. In this children's school, one day the head of the Moody Bible Institute, a man named Joseph Stowell, came and he was touring this home for, for children. And he noticed there were handprints all over the windows. And he asked, why are there all these handprints all over the windows? And the director of the school says, well, the children here love Jesus, and we told them that Jesus was coming back one day, and every once in a while, they just go and look up in the sky, look at the window, because they're ready to see Jesus. They're ready for him to come back, and so they're anxious for his return, and that's pretty much what the disciples were doing uh, in our text this morning. Jesus went up into the clouds, and they were standing there watching him, and then the angels came and said, why are you standing there? Uh, I had to put the title of the sermon in the bulletin a little early this week because we were out of town. And the more I thought about it, I wish I'd have changed it. Uh, in fact, in Facebook and online, I think I'm going to call this sermon, Why Are You Standing There? Or Don't Just Stand There. That sounds pretty good. Don't Just Stand There because that's what the angel was really telling the disciples. He said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? You see, it's kind of like the angels were telling the disciples the same thing that these children, the children were looking up at the sky because they wanted Jesus to come back. The disciples were looking up in the sky because they didn't want him to leave. And the angel said, don't just stand there. Jesus told you, you got something to do. Uh, they weren't saying you're wasting your time looking up in the sky. They're saying you need to get busy. Peter, Peter was there that day. He was one of the men that were standing looking up. Let's see what he said about it. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, Peter said this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Mark this. We're going to come back to this chapter a couple more times during the lesson. But Peter said, it is good that Jesus is coming back. He said, it's a good thing. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us it's going to be a great thing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says this, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Paul said, you don't have any idea. It can't be told what's waiting for you. What's going to happen? Uh, 
Let's see what God has prepared. Look at the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 3. We're told that when Jesus comes again, there'll be a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. God's going to make everything new. Let me ask you this. How many of you like the house where you're living? Okay, I, I like our house. It's comfortable. Uh, it's, it's very appropriate for us. But if a wealthy man came up to me tomorrow and said, I tell you what, I'm going to buy you a brand new house. It's going to be, have a two-car garage attached to it, have a fully equipped workshop, or you have all the tools you want. It's going to have bedrooms big enough and enough bedrooms for all your kids and families to come and visit with you whenever they want. It's going to have enough storage space to put all the things that have been accumulated over 46 years of marriage. If somebody came and made me that offer, I'd take them up on it. It's not that I don't like my old house, but that just sounds like something that's a whole lot better. Now, it's not that I don't appreciate what I've got. It's just that something that's all new would be better. And that's what the book of Revelation is telling us. When God comes down, he's got something new. He's got something better. He's going to take this rundown shack that, that I'm living in right now. And he's going to give me a mansion. Uh, it says he's going to make everything new. And 1 John chapter 3 uh, makes it even clearer. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Jesus. But what's Jesus like? Well, Jesus is powerful, and Jesus is immortal, and Jesus is all-knowing. Well, Jesus is not ever going to die. My body's mortal. My body's going to fall apart one day. I'm going to get sick. I'm going to die. But for the Christian, that's not really going to be a problem because Jesus is coming back, and all things are going to be made new. You might not have ever heard of a man named Stuart Hamlin, but I think you've probably heard about the song he wrote. Stuart Hamlin and a friend were out hunting one day, and they're out in the woods, and they came upon this old shack. And there was a dog laying on the porch of that shack. And they looked, and the dog hadn't been fed in a couple of days, and it's pretty obvious. And Stuart turned to his friend and says, whoever lives there is dead. And sure enough, they went inside the old house, and there they found the man's body. And Stuart Hamlin wrote a song about that experience. He said, this old house once knew my children. This old house once knew my wife. This old house was home and shelter as we fought the storms of life. This old house once rang with laughter. This old house heard many shouts. Now she trembles in the darkness when the lightning walks about. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix the shingles. Ain't got time to fix the floor. Ain't got time to oil the hinges nor to mend the window pane. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. I'm getting ready to meet the saints. Just like the day came that that old man didn't need that house anymore, the day's coming when we're not going to need this earthly body that we're living in anymore. We're going to be changed. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And begin down in verse 51. Paul writes this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall, we be brought to, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. We could go on and on about all the great things that are going to happen when Jesus comes back. And so Peter writes that we should be looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of the Lord. Hasting the day means we should be excited about it. We should be anxious for the Lord to return. 
But not everybody is. Not everybody's anxious about the Lord coming back. You may have seen this. I never watched any of this show. I, I saw the advertisements back in 2005. NBC had a TV show they called Revelations. And uh, the series, they called it a theological thriller. Uh, it was very, very loosely based on some biblical passages. The hero or heroine of Revelations was this nun named Sister Joe. And Sister Joe was examining strange phenomenon that were related to biblical prophecy. And the executive producer of the show said, Sister Joe believes in Revelation, but she refuses not to have hope. She feels that humankind can all come together and forestall the end of days. In other words, she thought, well, let's look and see what is going to happen before the Lord comes back. And let's see if we can stop those things from happening so that we can keep the world here longer. Why would anybody want to do that? We've just read about all the wonderful things that are going to happen to God's people when the Lord comes back. Why would we want to delay the second coming of Christ? Well, because not everybody's going to be excited about it. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus delivers a parable uh, talking about his second coming. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then down in verse 37, he explains what that parable meant. Verse 37 says, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be at the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Essentially, Jesus says when he comes back, a lot of people are going to go to hell. There's going to be gnashing of teeth. There's going to be weeping. There's going to be, they're going to be thrown into fire. That's not a happy outcome. So they're not, anxious for his return. But that's not really what God wants to happen. Go back to that passage in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. This time go back up one verse earlier to verse 9. Peter says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. God doesn't want anybody to perish. God wants everybody to be part of his kingdom. So he's patient with us. And he gives us time hoping that we'll repent and that we'll get to others' people that we love to repent and to change. But God understands not everybody's going to do that. Jesus warns us about that in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Why would anybody choose the wrong path? Well, because it's broad, and it's easy, and it's wide. Have you ever heard the phrase that you need to be more broad-minded? What does somebody mean when they tell you you need to be broad-minded? Well, it means you need to be more open to other people's opinions and other people's lifestyles, the way that other people 
want to live their life. You remember back when Duck Dynasty was a, a big hit on television, everybody was excited about the Robertsons and Duck Dynasty, and then uh, Phil said something that, that got everybody upset. He was suspended from the show for a few days because of, of his comments. Do you remember what Phil Robertson said that got everybody so upset? He said that homosexuality is sin. And that's what he said. Because of that, he was labeled as a narrow-minded bigot. Now, don't get me wrong. Bigotry is evil. Bigotry is wrong. We shouldn't be a bigot. The, the Webster says a bigot is one who regards or treats the members of a group such as a racial or ethnic group with hatred and intolerance. And as Christians, we're not supposed to hate anybody. We're supposed to love everybody. But let's just be just as clear about this. God calls us to be narrow-minded when it comes to some things. There are some things that as Christians... We shouldn't accept. That means that as Christians, we should be willing to call sin, sin. Because that's what it is. But the world's not comfortable with that. The world wants us to be broad-minded. Uh, and if we don't have an attitude that lets everybody live their own life, and we're not willing to, to support them in that, encourage them in that, then we're wrong. And that's not what God says. God says, don't be deceived. There's going to be a time coming and you need to make sure that you're living your life the way that the Word tells you that you need to live or you're going to be punished. I've been blessed to be able to go to Mount Vesuvius in Italy. If you ever get a chance to go, you need to go. It's a wondrous thing to see. Mount Vesuvius uh, is a volcano and it erupted in the year 79 AD. And the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were completely destroyed. But something about that uh, volcanic eruption is that the ash that spewed forth out of the volcano uh, covered all the people and all the things there. And when the archaeologists came, they were able to go back. Now, the bodies that were covered had long since decayed, but the lava and ash had hardened around them and made these forms. And they were able to pour plaster into those molds and see what the people looked like. And they could recreate all of these uh, scenes they'd seen. Uh, some of these I've been able to see, some of them I haven't, but I read that there were places where the owners of a house were storing all their valuables in a well, and they fell in the well before uh, the volcano erupted. There was a dog that was still chained to a fence. They had a woman that was holding an infant in her arms, and there were two young girls holding on to the hem of her garment. Uh, there was the remains of one woman that was found next to the wine vat, and inside the vat were over a hundred silver dishes and thousand pieces of gold. And on one of the silver cups was this inscription. It says, enjoy life while you have it, for tomorrow is uncertain. Okay. The tragedy was those people didn't have to die because they were warned. For weeks before the volcano erupted, there had been rumblings and earthquakes. There had been smoke pouring from out the top of the mountain they realized that something bad was going to happen. But they didn't want to give up their livestock. They didn't want to leave their homes and their valuables behind. So they kept on living the way they'd been living, even though they could see that something wasn't right. There was a problem coming on. They'd been warned, but they didn't respond to the warning. The same way when Jesus comes again, there's going to be some terrible things happen, but we've been warned. We've been told what's going to happen. Don't just stand there. That's the message of the lesson today. Uh, for those of us who belong to Jesus, the second coming is going to be a glorious, wonderful event. But for those who don't, it literally is going to be hell. There can't be anything possible worse. Now let's go back to the question that the angels asked the men that were standing there uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Why are you just standing there? Uh, why did he ask why? Because Jesus, right before he ascended, told them what they needed to be doing. And so they did. They went back to Jerusalem, and they received the power of the Holy Spirit. And they went out and they started proclaiming the gospel. And they went and told everybody what was going to happen. They didn't just stand there. But a lot of times when people expect Jesus to come back, that's what they do. They just stand there. Back in the second century, there was this man named Montanus. And he predicted that Jesus was coming back in a few days and all of his followers sold their belongings, went up into a mountain and sat there waiting for him to come. Don't just stand there. 
Uh, there was Pope Sylvester II. He predicted that Jesus was going to return January 1st, the year 1000. And the result is that a lot of people sat there and waited for him. There were riots. There was panic in the streets. People were just ready for Jesus to come. They just stood there. The Seventh-day Adventists were founded by a man named William Miller. He predicted that Jesus would come back Sunday, March 21st, 1844. And so his people, followers, put on white robes, and they went out and stood there waiting for Jesus to return. When Jesus didn't come back, he recalculated and said, oh, I missed the date. It's going to be October 22nd, 1844. And they went and waited for him again. The point is that when you think you know that Jesus is coming, the natural reaction is to just stand around and wait for him to come. Uh, there are others that sell books while they're standing around. There's a lot of the TV evangelists that all they talk about is the second coming of Jesus. And they write about the second coming of Jesus. And people have made up a lot of things about the second coming of Jesus. And they're getting rich on that. But that's not what the angels told the disciples to do. And those people don't know what they're talking about because Matthew 24, 36 says, But the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Revelation tells us about the second coming. There's the mention of the second coming several places in the New Testament. But how many books of prophecy are there in the whole New Testament? Just one. What's more important is that we're ready when the Lord comes back, that we're ready for that second coming. We can't just stand there. Our responsibility as Christians is to be ready for the Lord to come and to bring the world to Jesus before Jesus comes back to the world. That's our mission. That's what the angels told the New Testament, or the people that said, don't just stand there. The disciples, that's what Jesus told them. Before he left, he told them to go get the message out. And that's our call. Our focus is not on when the Lord's going to return. It's on what we need to do in the meantime. And Jesus made our mission clear in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 19. Go ye therefore... Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. That's our job. That's our challenge. That's what we've been told to do. Don't just stand there. We need to do something. I've told this story before. Back in 1780, the Connecticut House of Representatives was having a meeting and all of a sudden, the sky just got pitch dark. And none of them had seen anything like that before. In fact, it was so dark that they got to talk and they decided that this must be the end of the world. They'd never seen anything like this before, so they made a motion to adjourn. And one of the members, a man named Colonel Davenport, rose up and said this, The day of judgment is either approaching or it's not. If it's not, there's no call for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty Therefore, I wish that candles be brought. The day of the Lord may come in the year 2024. We don't have any way of knowing that. But in the meantime, we need to be the candles. We need to be the light of the world. We need to be the ones showing people the way to Jesus. That's what he told us in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you need to be a Christian. The only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. You can be added to the kingdom this very day. The way to have your sins forgiven today is the same way as it was in the first century when those disciples went and told the people on Pentecost, you need to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. You need to be willing to repent of your sins, to confess him as Lord of your lives, to be baptized and have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism, to rise up out of that watery grave as a new creature, and then follow Jesus, walk in the light as he is in the light. If you are a Christian, why are you just standing there? We need to be bringing the world to Jesus. Let's go one more time to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Skip down to verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. You're subject to the Lord's invitation this morning. Won't you come right now? We stand together as we sing.